Let's just give a hand to the Women Engaged team putting together this event. And I have to say, to have the opportunity to have in-person, face-to-face, I, I pray that we will never take for granted again. So apparently this is the inaugural, we're finally together in-person event. So it is an honor to be here. Uh, I uh, am a newbie to the Board of Trustees here at Denver Seminary. I uh, had the opportunity to meet with uh, Dr. Payne today and taped a podcast interview with him. Um, was really impressed with the president, Mark Young, um, incredible man, a humble, wise, um, as I interacted with him in the decision-making process, was really struck with who he is as a leader. And I have been on some board meetings via Zoom, but we'll finally have the first in-person one coming up in November, and I can't wait. So it's been a joy to be here on this campus, to meet some of the students. Um, I love women, and I love women um, leadership, women in ministry, all of that is a passion of mine. And I believe that women are remarkable. And I think that God has wired women to be a part of righting the wrongs. So to have an opportunity to be with you this evening is, is an honor. Um, I would love for you to get to know me a little bit. And so I will share with you a little of my story. I'm actually not um, new to Colorado. I grew up in Boulder, so I am granola at heart. And I was on, I was on the Pearl Street Mall, and there was the trash can that was like compost and trash and landfill or whatever. And I was just like, I love you, Boulder. So I am like, I'm granola through and through. I did not grow up in a Christian home. We were culturally Buddhist, which is kind of like the cartoon Mulan or Coco, where we would invite the uh, spirits of our dead ancestors for um, special occasions, and it didn't affect my life in any way. And then I sat next to my girlfriend in math class, and I sat next to her every day, and she started changing. She started to glow. And I'm like, what happened to you? Did you become a vegetarian? <laughs> and she goes, no, I became a Christian. I'm like, what does that mean? You go to church or something? And she goes, no, I have a personal relationship with Jesus. I'm like, oh no, because <laughs> she was so smart and funny. And I'm like, how, how could you be duped into believing this mythology, you know, and the Bible and, you know, who even wrote it anyway? And so she changed and her life was so marked by an intimacy with God that caught my attention. So that started me on my spiritual journey. I ended up putting my trust in Christ in high school due to the cute boys at the youth group, <laughs> truth be told. But I did. I gave my life to Christ, and I tried to live the Christian life. So I did not have a Bible. I drove to the mall. I bought a Bible, opened it up, tried to read it, and it was very, very boring. There are a lot of measurements, <laughs> a lot of kings that I cannot pronounce their names, and Everyone's mad at everybody, and I just, it did not make any sense, and it was not working for me. And so I would drive myself to church on Sundays, I would cry through all the worship songs, and then I'd go home, and life was just, just the same as before. I would consider myself a cultural Christian at that time, because it wasn't impacting my life in any way significantly. So then my dad, he goes through midlife crisis. So he gets the sports car, which was great, in high school, I learned to drive a stick shift. Then he comes home with a perm. <laughs> you know it's getting serious when the dad comes home with a perm. And then he comes home with the news that we were going to move right before my senior year of high school. And we weren't moving across town. We weren't even moving to another state. We were moving after 17 years in Boulder, Colorado, to Hong Kong. For those of you that understand Cantonese, I grew up speaking Mandarin. I did not speak Cantonese, and it's a completely different dialect, even though the characters are all the same. So I couldn't understand a word of what was being spoken. I knew no one, and I was really mad at God. So I let him have it. I sat there on my bed in the flat in Hong Kong, and I just said, I'm ticked off. <laughs> I really, though, in my heart of hearts, want to know you and I need a church, I need a youth group, I need some Christian friends, and if you do that, I will give you my whole life, I will hold nothing back. Otherwise, I'm going to go out and get drunk, do something I'll probably regret, but I'm never talking to you again. 
So obviously, if I'm standing here, <laughs> so many years later, God came through in Hong Kong. And it was in Hong Kong that I met for the first time other Christians that were like my friend in math class, who lived what they believed. And I finally got grounded in my faith. And I think the biggest difference was that I followed through on my part. I said, I'm all in. I'm all in. Whatever you say, I'll do. Wherever you want me to go, I'll go. I am completely surrendered to you. And I now understand that that decision kind of unleashed God's spirit to open up my eyes to understand the scriptures. Everything started to to make sense. I started to glow, like I started having the glow. So um, that was the most significant decision, not just to give control of my life to God. Well, now here we are, 2021, and all of us, I think, have been through the ringer in some way, shape, or form. We have, our lives and our souls are, are altered because of what we have just walked through and are still walking through. I explained it to a friend. I think this is a really bad, like, B movie. Like, really bad acting, really bad cinematography, <laughs> really bad storyline. Like, we don't like this. Like, one star would not recommend. <laughs> And we are living in this moment and in this time, and life has not been how we thought it would be. So I'm going to just take a little bit of time this evening to share with you a few simple principles. Um, you're welcome to take notes if you like. Some of these stories are also in some of the books that I've written, but I just wanted to um, bring you up to speed on that. So this first uh, thought, when life doesn't go as planned, that is the longer we live, the more times we circle the sun, we realize that life does not go as we planned. And our best laid efforts don't always turn out the way that we thought they would be. Uh, the book that I wrote most recently, Open Hands, Willing Heart, is loosely rooted in the book of Esther. And uh, Esther is a phenomenal book in the Old Testament. There's no mention of God in all 10 chapters. And yet God is incredibly at work. His providence is undeniable. And I think in Esther's life, her life did not go as planned. She was orphaned. We don't know what age she was orphaned, but she was orphaned. She was, for, for our modern day t terminology, was trafficked. Uh, she did not voluntarily, you know, join this beauty pageant. This was all the young virgins of the land gathered together. Um, she ended up being married to um, a pagan. Um, she ended up being in a position to rescue the Jewish people. I think that in her life, one of the major turning points was her willingness to say, if I perish, I perish. It's the same for those of you who are Harry Potter people. It's when Harry Potter, at the very end, said, I'm willing to die. And that's when the thing opened up. And I think that that's the calling for each of us when life does not go as planned. That we, once again, choose to surrender. Willing hearts surrender to God, his rule and his ways. And God does not change. He, his character, his attributes are unchanging. His intentions toward us never change. I love uh, studying the last words of Jesus, uh, chapters John 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17, are Jesus' last recorded words before to his closest disciples before he goes to the cross. And I think it's well worth our time to dig into these particular chapters to see what are the themes, what are the repeated words, what are the things that Jesus was so wanting to impart to his closest disciples. And you read over and over, about love, about prayer, about the Holy Spirit, about abiding. So I'm going to pick us up in John 15 and just share with you a few different scriptures here. Jesus said in John 15, 1, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away Every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. 
And then he goes and explains that we are to abide in him and abide in the vine and abide in me. And he is the vine and we are to abide in him. And so often in our North American Christianity, we talk about Jesus in us. And that's really only a handful of times in the scriptures, many hundreds of times. It's who we are in Christ. The focus is always goes back to Jesus. We focus on fruit and wanting to be fruitful and wanting to have fruitful ministry. Fruit is just a byproduct. The real source of life is found in the vine. So if you want to increase your yield, you increase your yield. If you want to increase your yield of fruit, you increase your yield. Surrender to the vine. I thought of that at Starbucks. <laughs> no one was around, so I kind of high-fived myself like, ah! <laughs> if you want to increase your yield, you increase your yield. Okay, <laughs> that's just a freebie. That's just a freebie. So, unfortunately, and this is true of just life, it says right here, every branch that Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. And this pruning process does not make sense to me because I can't make things grow like succulents die. I don't even have thumbs. There's not even like green thumbs. It's like there's no, like I don't have brown thumbs. I have no thumbs. <laughs> things do not grow with me, but they do grow. My husband grows things. So... We have in our backyard in Southern California a grapevine that was planted by the previous owners. And uh, we had one bumper crop year because it rained in California. <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> Water creates fruit. So uh, we had bumper crop fruit, like we had bowls of grapes. And it was just like, we are eating off the land, kids. <laughs> it's just like eating the grapes. And you know, there's all sorts of possibilities with grapes. So our next door neighbor, Papa John, hails from Italy, like legit Italian. We're talking big old Italian pasta belly, and he knew about grapes, and he knew about wine, and he would make his own wine, and he'd bring over mason jars of wine for us, and it was really exceptional, right? So he comes over with his toothpick in his mouth and his little undershirt on, and he's got, you know, all the Italian hand gestures, and I'm watching from the kitchen, like watching them. And so he says, which means get out the loppers. So Darren goes and gets out the loppers, and Papa John starts lopping away. Like, it's one thing to lop away the dead stuff. That makes sense to me. He was lopping away the very branches that had produced the big bowls of fruit. And the Chinese in me is like, ay it's waste. It's like, no. So there's something about this, this pruning process. And we learn from Papa John that red grapes are pruned differently than the white grapes. The, the vine dresser knows how and when and exactly how much, and God knows that as well. And when life does not go according to plan, we have to trust that the vine dresser knows what he's doing and his timing. So part of my story is that I... Uh, my three kids, who are now young adults, so I feel like there's the small kids, and then there's the medium kids, and now I have the large kids, because <laughs> I am the shortest in my family now. But when my youngest finally got to school, and was in school full time, it was like, it was, there's all this new time that opened up. So I'm like, I'm going to start seminary. So I started my seminary degree at Talbot, and I'm still in it. <laughs> and I will graduate in 2054. <laughs> so... But I started seminary class. I now had time to be a part of a ministry executive team, so I was going to be exercising some of my leadership. And the sun was shining down on me, Matt Redman. Life was all as it should be. And I just thought, yes, we made it. And then, three days before Christmas, I received the phone call that no one ever wants. So let me just back up really quick. I had started leading a women's Bible study in the fall. We had a bunch of moms who's had their kids that came to our church for, for vacation Bible school. The kids had become Christians, and now the moms wanted to know, like, how do I help my kids grow? What is the Bible? So we had the most amazing, amazing Bible study where I was able to explain that the two dots mean chapter and verses. Like, that was the kind of Bible study that we were having. Incredible. Our lives started cutting very deeply into each other. And then my friend in the Bible study said, there's 
this woman in our neighborhood. We call her the Asian Martha Stewart. She's just, she just always looks so put together, and her home is always so perfect, and her kids are so well behaved, and the food that she makes is just so delicious. She's just flawless. And then this Asian Martha Stewart was diagnosed with breast cancer, and she was not a believer. People naturally wanted to help her, so they offered to, to bring meals, help with the kids, and she was like, no, 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 it's fine, it's fine, I'll be fine. And so she pushed away everyone, and she started going through her cancer treatment. Her body started breaking down, and she could not hold her perfect world together. And then she um, tragically took her own life, left behind her husband, her two kids. And I sat there in this food court where we were meeting for Bible study, and it was one of those things where it's like the movies where everything freezes, and God had my full attention. He's like, Viv, you don't know this Asian Martha Stewart, but you're just like her. You like to be the strong one. You like to help others. You have a hard time letting people in. And I just kind of nodded. And so I just promised God, I'm like, you're right. I purpose right here, right now. If anything like that ever happens to me, I will let people in. And God used that story to change the trajectory for me because I had found a lump, went to check it with my doctor. She wasn't worried about it. She goes, just in case, I'll give you a diagnostic mammogram. Went the Friday before school, got out for the kids with all their holiday parties and everything and just thought, it's just going to be like a mammogram and we're going to run off. And that turned into mammogram, which turned into ultrasound, which turned into core biopsy. And three hours later, I was just completely stunned. And... I went home, I pulled out my laptop, I sent an email to the women I would choose to have be my bridesmaids if I got married right now. That's kind of who you know you want to have around. And uh, three of them lived within 10 minutes of me. And so I texted them, I said, I really need you guys. Would you come and meet me um, tomorrow morning? And they're like, yes, we're there. So they came, they met me, and they gifted me with the present of presence. They had all been through their life derailings as well, so they knew enough to not try to spiritualize it and throw verses and try to fix it or change my mind. They just sat with me in my bewilderment, and they knew how hard it was to reach out and ask for their presence because you know, the biopsy could come back and it'd be negative. Like I might just be bothering them, but they were with me. That was part of that promise that I had made to God. So then that weekend, it rained in Southern California. It rained crazy bananas. It rained sideways and the rain matched what was going on inside my own heart. And so it rained all the way through and I was just waiting for the call Monday morning waited all day Monday, the rain kept pounding against the windows, and finally the call came in the afternoon, so I took the call from the doctor in the, in the garage, and um, the doctor said, um, I'm so sorry, you have invasive lobular carcinoma. And I'm taking this pen out, trying to make the ink run, and I'm like, excuse me, what? I had never heard those three words before. He goes, I'm sorry, you have breast cancer. We need to get you into the nurse practitioner, I'm gonna set you up for an appointment tomorrow, blah, 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 and then I was just, stunned. And my husband and I had had some fight about something really dumb because it was right before Christmas and you have Christmas magic and you have reality and you have disappointment. <laughs> so, so in the midst of the conflict, he walks out into the garage and he looks at me and um, he walks to the side of the car and I get out of the car and I look at him and just said, it's cancer. The doctor says it's cancer. And I just broke down sobbing in his t-shirt and he just put his arms around me and he just prayed like lord we are scared we don't know what to do would you please help us would you help us know that you're with us um we want to trust you we love you amen and our garage door has these little windows on it and um in the very moment that he finished praying i opened my eyes and uh there was a sunbeam that just landed right where we stood. And it was like the Lord saying, I'm here. 
I'm with you. I'm with you. So what I had realized that with my girlfriends, there's a difference between transparency and vulnerability. Being in college ministry for 28 years, um, college students, they want to know real stuff. And so I had learned to be transparent with the hard things that I had learned and the lessons I had gone through from hard times. Vulnerability is being right in the middle of it all with no answers and no lessons learned. So transparency was something I could do. Vulnerability was entirely different. And I think that was one of the lessons I need to learn about community. So scripture says that there is nowhere we can go that God is not. And even when we can't see or feel, God is here and he is with us. To me, when life does not go as planned, we always have a decision to make with the posture of our heart and of our hands. And I think there's, uh, there's this river of trust is kind of how I picture it. Um, I'm always going to be a mountain girl. So if you picture with me, this is probably not completely accurate, but it's a visual for you. It's almost like when we start in our journey with God, we start at the base of the mountain, and there's this river that we have to cross. And it's scary, and it's cold, but we kind of get there, and we get through, and we just, we make it through, and we experience intimacy with God that we didn't have before that moment. And then we keep traveling, and then we come to the river again. It's like, I already crossed the river, but it's time to cross the river again. And so we we kind of re-up again, and we go through the river, this river of trust, and we keep going throughout life. Each time when life is not going as planned, we have to trust him. But every time we get further, we see farther, and we see God's faithfulness. But it doesn't take away how challenging it is to get into the river, the river of trust. We have a decision with open hands that means that we allow God to put things into our lives. We also allow him to take things out of our lives. And this posture of open hands, I think I, I'm a bossy firstborn, and so sometimes I get very, um, how do you say, demanding in my prayers. Like, God, this is the problem. This is how you're supposed to fix it. And you need to do it now or tomorrow. And I just kind of present that whole thing. And I do believe that the Lord wants to hear our hearts and prayers, but I think more and more, the older I get, sometimes the most honest prayer is just to go, here, your will be done. Because there are things that I cannot see or understand. And so I give you my open hands. And willing heart, there's three postures of a heart. One is a willful heart where you're doing it in your own efforts and your own strength and it's unsustainable. And I think a lot of Christians are trying to live the Christian life so hard in their own efforts and they burn out and they end up feeling very used or resentful. A willful heart. This is where if you're in ministry in any sense, it can be really easy to try to eke it out in your own efforts willful. You could also have a will-less heart where it's just like, oh, it's just going to be what's going to be, so whatever. And God asks for a willing heart, a heart that's like, I don't know what you're doing, but I'm going to trust you in it, however you work. So posture of our heart, how we live with the open heart, open hands, also is equally important the people that we are around. This idea of community, we throw it around often in fellowship and community, what that really means, but the scriptures are clear that we are to live in relationship to one another because we cannot live the Christian life on our own. We were designed to be in community. So after my cancer journey, when I would read the scriptures, I had a whole new view because we opened our life and we let people in. And I think our entire little church had our garage code memorized. And they kept filling our refrigerator with all sorts of delicious food. And people were coming alongside as we let them. And we learned to be gracious receivers. And honestly, that's so hard on my pride. But it is such an important part of our spiritual growth. 
So a passage like Hebrews 12, 1 to 3, therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for, for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. I had memorized that passage. I had taught Bible studies on that passage, but I had never seen until after this cancer journey. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. It was always meant to be lived in community. And when life does not go as planned, those are the times we most need to connect with one another. And so whether it's through small groups, neighbors, um, whether it's through the community here at Denver Seminary, we have to choose vulnerability and choose community. And that really is some of the secret sauce when life does not go according to plan. The other thing that I realize is that we often don't realize what is going on and how our lives will make a difference. I have a younger sister, and when she was in high school, God gave her a burden for the country of Albania. I have no sense of direction. Like, well, I don't know where North is. I have no sense of direction, but she bought a shower curtains of the world shower curtain. So she had black Sharpie, and she'd circled Albania, and she had all these statistics in the shower. So I learned about Albania. <laughs> I learned that Albania is a small country of 2.3 million people in Southeast Europe. And in 1967, the dictator of the country declared Albania the world's first atheistic state. So as a high schooler, my sister started praying. She prayed for doors to open for the gospel to enter this closed country. She prayed for the remote villages inaccessible to outsiders. She prayed for Albanian nationals to join staff with crew. She prayed for generations of multiplying discipleship. She prayed Albania would one day be a sending nation to the Muslim world. And these prayers made no sense because the country was locked to the outside world. The communist regime fell in 1992, and for the first time, crew, Camps Crusade was able to send teams of college students in to do ministry with university students. My sister was in college at that time, so she applied. She got all the immunizations, she got her passport, she raised all her financial support, and she went with such high expectation to this country that she had prayed probably daily for, for years. She had the worst, worst summer of her life. The instability of the government had led to food shortages, so there were many nights that she went to bed hungry, not knowing what she was going to eat the next day. <sighs> Illness, swarms of insects that attacked her, verbal abuse from the Albanian nationals, chaos surrounded my sister. And they were, uh, the rest of her team didn't seem affected by any of these things. An Albanian national named Alma served as a translator. And then halfway through the summer, they were all in the capital of Tirana. Halfway through the summer, they decided to split the team in half, send one team up north to the beaches to do ministry, where she wanted to go, and the other team to the south. And that's where she ended up, as well as her emotions. So the mission ended with no show for the effort, the prayer, the expense. The spiritual ground was rock hard. No one responded to the gospel. And my sister returned here to the US, dejected. She went through depression. She carried parasites in her intestines. Seven years later, Crew, many of you know, has a national conference or used to have a national conference in Fort Collins where we would have all of our staff show up, 5,000 of us descend on the CSU campus. And there, in front of the 5,000 staff, the first Albanian national staff person was being interviewed on stage, Alma. And when asked how she became a Christian, she shared that my sister Claire 
had led her to the Lord. And all these years, she had no idea. So they got together, and uh, Claire said, what happened? And Alma said, do you remember sitting in the dorm, and you asked me, Alma, are you perfect? And she said, I knew I wasn't perfect. And in that moment, everything that I had been translating all summer long made sense. And I knew that I needed Jesus to be my Savior. And so that's when I placed my trust in him. Then Alma shared that she became an, a leader in Albania. She's actually now one of the national directors in Albania. She's discipled hundreds of women. Albanian nationals joined staff. Teams showed the Jesus film in remote mountain villages. Albania became a sending nation to the Muslim world, sending teams into neighboring Turkey and beyond. And God had turned the first atheistic country to one where 96% of the people had opportunities to hear the gospel. And how kind of the Lord to allow my sister to hear how her life had made a difference. Um, just this first weekend of September, my husband and I um, were speaking at the Family Life Weekend to Remember Marriage Conference in Augusta, Georgia. And we had the privilege of leading a gal who originally grew up in Albania, who's culturally Muslim to the Lord. And when my husband and I realized that she was from Albania, the first thing we thought of was, she's probably another answer to my sister's prayers. So it's like Taylor Swift with the invisible thread, gold string tying me to you. There's just so much more going on in our lives than we even realize. And even when life doesn't make sense and things are not going how we thought they should, God is at work, and we do not see the end of the story. Do not lose heart. It all matters. This is the closest I'll ever get to a cooking show. Apple. Thank you, Shannon, for the knife. I can cut open an apple, and I can pull out all of these little seeds, and I can count how many seeds are inside an apple, but I have no idea how many apples are in a seed, and the seed is your life. And Jesus says that we are to die to ourselves and trust him with the results with the fruit, with how our lives can make a difference. And sometimes it's those times when we are in the darkness and no one else knows what's really going on and life is not how we thought it was going to be, that actually some of the greatest work is being done in our souls that helps sustain us for the rest of the journey. What Jesus asks of us is nothing less in our whole lives. And this side of heaven, we may not get to hear the difference that it made, that we drove carpool, that we said hi to the Trader Joe's woman at the checkout counter, that the things that we do, that we're just doing as we go along life, that they really, really, truly do matter. But one day, we will. And I think at the top of the list is going to be all of the prayer warriors that were praying in secret, that cleared the way. Um, so long as we have breath in our lungs and a heart that beats, we are still on mission. And it matters that we live with intention. I'm going to dismiss you guys to discussion group questions right now in your table. And... Um, would love for you guys to be able to kind of process and talk through um, what we talked about tonight. But I want to um, pray with you, and then given some time, we might do a little Q&A. We'll see how the timing works, but I'm going to stop here and just pray for us. Father, I want to thank you for the women here tonight. Um, I pray, God, for each of them that they would hear from you the things that you would like for them to be reminded of 
of your character, of your intention, of your purpose. And for those especially that are having a hard time right now because life is not how they thought it would be, I pray an extra measure of grace and strength. And I pray you would surround these women with community and true sisters and fellowship. I pray for um, courage to be vulnerable and to let people in. And I pray for um, how you will use each of these women in their places and their spaces. I thank you so much that our, our little lives are a part of something so much greater. So Lord, be glorified in our lives and through our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.